In the late 1840s, two young Irishmen boarded ships bound for the United States of America. One from the rural village of Bruff in County Limerick in the west of Ireland, and the other from County Wexford on the east coast. Following the failure of the previous year's potato harvest, these men were escaping the prospect of starvation. Following a treacherous passage across the Atlantic, these men arrived in North America and settled in Boston. Their story, like so many Irish people arriving into an alien land, was a familiar one, of struggle against the prejudice against Irish Catholics prevalent in American society at the time. For years, these men and their offspring toiled in working class jobs, starting out as salesmen, common labourers and tavern owners. Gradually, their descendants began to rise up in American society. Almost a hundred years after their arrival, on Tuesday the 8th of November 1960, a young senator from Massachusetts named John Fitzgerald Kennedy was elected to the highest office in the land, President of the United States of America. JFK, during a historic visit to Ireland in June 1963, spoke proudly of his heritage to the crowd at New Ross. When my great-grandfather left here to become a cooper in East Boston, JFK said, he carried nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong desire for liberty. I'm glad to say that all of his great-grandchildren have valued that inheritance. The two men who had arrived into the United States in the 1840s were Kennedy's direct relatives, Thomas Fitzgerald of County Limerick and Patrick Kennedy of County Wexford. Kennedy's victory signalled to the people of Ireland, and particularly to those communities who had been forced to leave their homeland during the famine of the possibility of overcoming the odds and achieving success. JFK's victory appeared to be the ultimate Irish immigrant success story. And yet Kennedy's victory could be interpreted in another light. While his victory was clearly a sign that attitudes were changing, Kennedy was nonetheless the first Irish Catholic to become president. It had taken over 170 years for the descendants of the people of Ireland to establish themselves, without doubt, as a central part of American life. Even in the 1960s, many continued to see Kennedy's Irish Catholic background as a serious mark against his name. The question remained, why had it taken so long for Irish immigrants to be accepted into their adopted countries? Hello and welcome to video 4 on the topic of migration and empire from 1830 to 1939. The story of the Kennedys and Fitzpatricks, beginning with the Great Famine in the 1840s, reminds us of both the challenges and opportunities that the people of Ireland faced when leaving their homeland. In this video, we will examine the difficulties the Irish faced in a country far closer to home, in Scotland. And just like in the United States, it would take many years for the Irish living in Scotland to overcome prejudice and reach their full potential. When it comes to immigration, of one group of human beings entering a foreign country, first impressions are really important. The goal of most immigrants, and of the governments who welcome them, is something called assimilation. For someone to assimilate into a new society, they must be said to have adapted to the new society's cultural and behavioural patterns. For example, if someone from England emigrated to France and wanted to assimilate, they might have to learn how to speak French or adopt some of the traditions of French culture. The story of Irish immigration into Scotland is not straightforward and we should be wary of making sweeping generalisations. Having said this, it would be wrong to suggest that the Irish had an easy time integrating into Scotland, particularly in the first 30 years of this period. As late as 1932, the Conservative Member of Parliament for Perth declared to Parliament, culturally the Irish population has not been assimilated into the Scottish population. There is in the west of Scotland a completely separate race of alien origin whose presence there is bitterly resented by tens of thousands of the Scottish working class. This view reflects a pattern that goes back to the very beginning of the Irish immigration story in Scotland. The first significant entry of Irish people into Scotland came at the start of the 19th century. During this early phase of Irish immigration, the Irish were treated with suspicion but also tolerance. The Irish immigrants who came in the 1820s and 1830s migrated to the country in relatively small numbers and they did so over a long period of time and for largely economic reasons, for example working in the annual harvest. While facing some discrimination, many Scots were beginning to accept their new Irish neighbours. 
An individual writing in the Glasgow Courier in 1830 writes, for example, that in our opinion, the Irish have as much right to come to this country to better their lives as the Scots and English have to go to Ireland or any other part of Britain for the same reason. Let us hear no more complaints about the influx of Irish having a bad effect on Scotland. So in the early days, there were some signs of tolerance. These early signs of tolerance, however, were misleading. The outbreak of the famine in Ireland in 1846 led at least 80,000 Irish to come to Scotland in the space of 10 years. If you want to hear more about the famine and why the Irish came to Scotland, make sure you check out the previous video which focuses on this question. The reaction of the Scots to the arrival of tens of thousands of people escaping the famine in Ireland was largely one of panic. One academic has written recently that in Glasgow in 1847, the town authorities and the middle class in general viewed the new arrivals with fear, horror and alarm. Under the heading The Irish Invasion, the Glasgow Herald, in the same year, depicted a city overrun by a starving multitude. The streets are at present literally swarming with vagrants from the sister country, and the misery which many of these poor creatures endure can scarcely be less than what they have fled or been driven from at home. It was not just newspapers, however, that condemned the Irish arrivals. Even Catholic bishops were concerned over the scale of Irish immigration. John Murdoch wrote in April 1847, the starving Irish are flocking into Glasgow by every boat and are literally ruining us. This is going to be a terrible year in the West. So what explains such a hostile reaction, not only in the press, but also in the eyes of Catholic priests, to the arrival of the Irish? To understand this, I thought we might reflect for a moment on the broader question of what makes immigration difficult of what sort of challenges outsiders coming into a new country typically face. The challenge immigrants coming into a new country face reflects the challenge of outsiders in all human societies. From an evolutionary perspective, the problem begins with the fact that humans display a preference for their own tribe or in-group. And, unfortunately, this often leads to treating the outgroup of outsiders with suspicion and even hostility. The preference humans have for the known over the unknown can be seen in the earliest stages of childhood. Children learn to develop trust for their own family members, those who are familiar, while displaying fear or a lack of trust towards strangers. As they grow up, people's marked preference for the familiar and suspicion for the unfamiliar typically extends to the wider community that they grow up in. Ultimately, this can lead to associating positive characteristics to one's own nation or race and negative connotations to other nations. So how might this make life difficult for immigrants? The problem when it comes to a new group entering a foreign country should be becoming clearer. When outsiders enter a new community, there is always a risk that that group might be met with fear and suspicion from the native inhabitants. This makes the challenge of assimilating into society even trickier for immigrants. So how can assimilation be achieved? There are several factors that impact how new immigrants are received by the local population. Factors that impact this perception include wealth, ethnicity, language, employment status, as well as the scale and speed of immigration. So what bearing does this have on the Irish who came to Scotland in the 19th century? There are three key issues here, the scale and speed of arrival, religious and racial tensions, and economic concerns. It is hard to overstate just how unfortunate the timing was for the Irish who arrived into Scotland in the 1840s and 1850s. The outbreak of the potato famine in 1846 led at least 80,000 Irish to come to Scotland in the space of just 10 years. This was immigration on a completely different scale from what Scotland had previously experienced. Not only did the Irish arrive in massive numbers in the space of a few years, but rather than spreading out throughout the country, they tended to live in a very small number of places. And it was this pattern which helped to form the graphic impressions of a society under siege. In 1851, nearly a fifth of the populations of the cities of Glasgow and Dundee had been born in Ireland. There are reasons to believe that the speed at which Irish people began to enter into the country from 1846 onwards would have raised even greater fears. Research conducted in New Zealand in 2021 found that the speed at which people enter a new country is one of the main factors that shapes attitudes towards those people. 
The basic rule is that the faster a new group of people moves into a country, the worse the reaction from the local inhabitants. This would explain why, as the historian Thomas Devine notes, the language almost universally employed in the press to describe the Irish dehumanises them and also captures the sense of a host society overwhelmed by the weight of numbers. To make matters even worse, the inevitable consequence of overcrowding in industrial centres led to the outbreak of disease. Glasgow, Dundee and Edinburgh suffered from typhus, dysentery, cholera and smallpox. A typhus epidemic, in particular made worse by overcrowding, broke out in 1847. The impact of such diseases can be seen in an enormous increase in the death rate in the west of Scotland. In Glasgow, for example, in 1845 there were 8,259 burials, and by 1847 this figure had more than doubled to 18,886. We can now look at our second factor, which is that of religion. Of the thousands of Irish immigrants who came to Scotland, a majority, 75%, were Catholic and only 25% were Protestant. Why is this significant? Scotland was a strongly Protestant country in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Catholics and Protestants, the two dominant groups within Christianity, had a long and storied history of conflict. Already considered to be outsiders because of their nationality, the 75% of Irish who were also Catholic often faced even greater discrimination. Catholics and Protestants were generally educated in separate schools and each group began to create increasingly separate organisations that could often come into conflict. Football clubs are perhaps the clearest example of this. Celtic Football Club, founded by the Catholic priest Walfred in 1887, were joined by Edinburgh Hibernian and Dundee Harp in the late 19th century. These groups and their supporters regularly clashed with the Protestant-founded clubs of Hearts, based in Edinburgh, and Rangers, based in Glasgow. The old firm between Celtic and Rangers remains one of the most fiercely contested rivalries in modern football. Indeed, as late as 1923, the Church of Scotland published a pamphlet titled The Menace of the Irish Race to Our Scottish Nationality. The pamphlet did not pull any punches, declaring that they, meaning the Irish Catholics, cannot be assimilated and absorbed into the Scottish race. It was not just Scottish Protestants who could be hostile. The Loyal Orange Order, a group of Protestants hostile to Catholicism, was established by Irish Protestants seeking to make their separate identity clear to the Scots. The third point to consider is that of economics and the economic impact that the Irish had in Scotland. The early impression some Scots developed towards the Irish was, unsurprisingly, unfavourable given the conditions in which so many arrived during the famine years. Indeed, there are good reasons to believe that the early Irish settlers tended to be disproportionately poor. The preferred destination for many Irish immigrants was North America, but the passage across the Atlantic was more expensive, therefore the Irish that came to Scotland tended to have less money. The desperate condition of Irish workers and the hostile treatment they received made them particularly vulnerable to offers of money. At this time they gained a reputation as strike breakers. Scottish industry could be precarious at this time, with many periods of mass unemployment followed by sudden demands for workers. The insecure nature of industrial work, however, meant that wages were often deeply insufficient. Scottish workers would often strike, meaning they refused to work demanding better quality pay. Unfortunately, one of the tactics the employers would use at this time was to hire Irish workers, often desperate to the point of starvation, to come and work for less money than their Scottish counterparts. This happened most often in the coal and iron industries and, understandably, it infuriated Scottish workers. However, the impression of the Irish as a burden on the Scottish economy was far from the truth. In the long term, there is no doubt that Irish workers contributed hugely to the enormous economic growth Scotland experienced in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The construction of railways, canals, docks, roads and harbours owes a huge debt to Irish labour. As time went on, more Irish people began to work in other heavy industries, such as steel, iron manufacturing and coal mining. Over the years, Irish workers became more and more united with Scottish workers and soon helped to develop trade unions that would fight for better working conditions and better pay. And this created unity between both groups. We can now briefly summarise what we have learned so far. 
First, we introduce the story of JFK, whose election victory in 1960 highlighted the opportunities, but also the challenges that the Irish people faced when coming to new countries in the 19th and 20th centuries. We then focused on the question of Irish immigration to Scotland and highlighted three key problems that they faced. The first was their speed of entry into Scotland. With 80,000 arriving in the space of 10 years from 1846 onwards, mostly into a small number of cities in the lowlands, there was an impression of Scots being overwhelmed. The spread of disease, unemployment and industrial unrest only worsened this impression. The second key point was that of religion. 75% of Irish immigrants were Catholic, and this created something of a separate identity that was a further source of tension. Finally, we looked at the question of economics. The Irish in the long haul provided an enormously positive contribution to Scotland, helping them to construct roads, railways and canals crucial to their economic development. But in the short term, many people in Ireland were seen as a drain on the Scottish economy, relying on charity or being perceived as strike breakers. The key point is that over time, this impression of the Irish began to change. By the early 20th century, particularly after and during the First World War, the shared experience of Scottish and Irish soldiers and workers tended to unite them together, making most realise they had far more in common than they had in difference. While there remained some sectarian violence, particularly in Scottish football, in the rivalry between clubs like Celtic and Rangers, as the 20th century wore on, the Irish were increasingly likely to be seen as part of the Scottish community. Thanks for watching this video, hopefully you found it helpful. Comment below for any feedback or any topics you'd like me to cover and please drop me an email if you are looking for a history tutor as I am currently accepting students. So thanks for watching and see you next time.